Good afternoon and welcome to this PRI webinar about modern slavery and creating meaningful action. I'm Nahida Chowdhury, a consultant on social issues at the PRI, and I will be your moderator for today. Now, today's webinar is intended to inform signatories and other stakeholders about what substantive action on modern slavery looks like, with insights from our speakers' work who are each heavily involved in tackling modern slavery. And then there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions to the panellists. Now, before I introduce the speakers, a brief recap on what is driving some of the interest and action on modern slavery. Firstly, regulation. The provision of the Modern Slavery Act 2015 requires any company operating in the UK with an annual turnover above 36 million sterling to produce a statement setting out steps that have been taken to ensure that there is no modern slavery in their business and supply chains with the UK government expecting to see these statements evolve and improve over time. Secondly, as we know, the appearance of modern slavery can be complex and concealed, and therefore there's greater responsibility on companies to demonstrate to its stakeholders that they're part of work that is mitigating modern slavery within their company and along their supply chain. For investors, acting as responsible shareholders and engaging on the issues of modern slavery, this often forms part of a holistic approach to understanding a company's human rights approach and oversight. And lastly, there's also <clears throat> international momentum on human rights and due diligence and impacts. We're seeing many emerging regulations on modern slavery across the world. If you're a signatory, please get in touch with myself at nahida.chowdhury at unpri.org if you would like to learn more about our work and specifically if you would like to participate in an investor briefing on modern slavery. And please get in touch by the 16th of March. I'm delighted now to introduce our three speakers who will bring insight on modern slavery from a corporate investor and the Office of the Anti-Slavery Commissioner perspective. Our first speaker is Louise Nichols, who is MNS Corporate Head of Human Rights, Food Sustainability and Food Packaging. She leads the strategic human rights and modern slavery agenda across MNS different business areas to support their local leadership teams develop implementation plans. Now, MNS human rights approach has been recognized for its leadership coming top of the food and beverage and apparel sector in the global corporate human rights benchmark. To date, MNS has published two human rights reports and two modern slavery statements, reflecting a business focused and determined to embed respect for human rights in how they do business. Our second speaker is Matt Crossman. He's a stewardship director for Rathbone Investment Manager and engagement manager for Rathbone Green Bank Investments. Green Bank have led investor engagement on supply chain risks and modern slavery for over a decade, most noticeably coordinating investor engagement on the UK's Modern Slavery Act 2014-2015. Rathbone Green Bank have partnered with various NGOs to produce benchmark reports in the UK responses to managing the risks of modern slavery, and most recently engaged with companies on the responses under the Modern Slavery Act. Our third speaker is Emily Kenway, who is a labour market and private sector advisor to the independent anti-slavery commissioner, Kevin Highland. She supports the Commissioner to work on all issues relating to modern slavery within the labour market, including on supply chain best practice and scrutiny of company disclosures, alongside public procurement, high street slavery and other aspects. Now, Emily previously ran the Fair Tax Mark, was a campaign manager for the Living Wage Foundation and worked extensively with investors on multiple ESG issues as head of projects at the NGO Share Action. Now, there will be a series of short presentations from each speaker, followed by Q&A for those joining the webinar. So please follow the instructions on your screen in the bottom right to type any questions, stating which panellist the question is for. So, Louise, um, over to you. Um, why are we talking about modern slavery? Well, it is an absolutely heinous crime, and uh, the incidents are on the rise. Um, the number of people reported as potential victims of slavery and human trafficking in the UK has more than doubled in the past three years. And if we just take the latest estimates that at least four, 40 million people around the world are in some form of slavery. It's also it's a, an industry business-wide issue. Um, a recent study by the Ethical Trading Initiative found that 71% of companies believe there's a likelihood of bond slavery occurring in their supply chains. 
And I think the important bit is that I don't believe there is any business that can say um, that uh, there, there isn't a likelihood of modern slavery in their supply chain. Um, and we've actually talked about it in our um, human rights reports and in our modern slavery statements. We have found issues and then we've dealt with them. The next slide wants to move, it does. Um, so this is just a highlight. Again, modern slavery is not a recent issue that we've been dealing with. It with. Back in 1999, uh, we joined the ETI and we published our global sourcing principles. And in 2001, I was part of holding workshops with um, suppliers and the ETI and trade unions and the police to raise the issue of, of gang masters. So we've been involved for a very long time. Um, and we played a key role in the founding of the precursor, the Temporary Labour Working Group, and then the Gangmaster Licensing Abuse Authority, as well as the Association of Labour Providers, and more recently supporting the found, founding of initiatives like Stronger Together and the Modern Slavery Helpline. I think what's really important is that the Modern Slavery Act has been game-changing. It's got the subject on, on board's agendas and business for the first time, considering the issue, not just because the customer tells them to, but because um, they need, now need to have their own um, way of dealing with this issue. And it's great to see um, the government being even clearer um, in their guidance to business um, about the statement content and the governance, but we still think it needs to move much further um, and publish a list of companies that should be completing the modern slavery statement. Currently, um, depending on which registry you want to, to go with, there's 4,000 uh, modern slavery in the Modern Slavery Registry, and in TISC, there's just over um, nearly 10,000 um, statements published. But that's a long way short of the 19,000 Modern Slavery statements that should be published. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, how does Marks & Spencers deal with this um, in our own business? What we did was we identified for every single business unit that they needed to complete a risk assessment uh, using a variety of inputs, external indices, uh, their own supplier assessments, uh, some stakeholder engagement, and where, then where they identified the risk, um, really um, investigating it further with um, due diligence. What's really important is that we more effectively hear vic victims' concerns and then triangulate this with our other data to inform the effectiveness of our interventions. And in addition to sponsoring the UK Modern Savory Help Helpline, we're strengthening our own existing grievance mechanisms, um, uh, really just to make sure we're hearing those concerns as quickly as we can and acting on them. And then to raise awareness of modern savory requirements and our human rights, our CEO wrote to every single uh, partner and supplier of goods and services, highlighting the importance. And then we've provided a range of um, awareness training. So um, in January, end of January, we held a conference in India for um, all our suppliers and our partners, um, for logistics, IT, um, our retail, um, our franchise partners, our clothing and home suppliers, our, our food suppliers, uh, bringing them all together and talking about what modern slavery looked like in the Indian context. And we've done a similar thing in the UK. Um, and uh, last December, I was doing a similar thing in South Africa with Woolworth South Africa, because we recognize that talking about it um, you know, making it um, something not to fear, but to recognize that even the best companies will find the issue, and it's what we do about it, rather than worrying about finding the issue. We've also developed then tools to support it, like the Modern Slavery Toolkit featured in the, um, in the slide. In the next slide, here we go. Um, and then what we've done is that we've formed um, a really strong governance structure to support this for Marks and Spencers. Um, so um, human rights is firmly embedded into our new sustainability plan, representing 19 out of the 100 commitments that we've made. Um, and then we've, we've um, for the first two years, we've, we've formed our own human rights uh, report. This year, you'll see that uh, when we publish our report in June, that it's embedded back into the Plan A report, because you know, from our perspective, this is about making it, embedding it, making it part of how we do business. We've also published two human, um, modern slavery statements, and again, you'll see our third modern slavery statement coming out this June. Um, we formed a really strong governance structure, which is illustrated um, in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of these slides. Um, and then we further strengthened it by forming um, an advisory uh, group of uh, human rights and modern slavery experts, really just to help keep challenging us about whether or not we're moving fast enough. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, 
you know, this is really not something any one business can do on their own. It's about working collaboratively with lots of other businesses um, to really uh, get down to the grassroots and understand how the issue manifests itself and then what can we do that will really drive transformational action. Um, this slide just shows you transparency. We think transparency is absolutely vital um, in moving the dial on this. And so again, we've published a supply chain map which uh, illustrates what our first tier suppliers are. Um, and you know, again, really welcome the fact that we've seen other of our competitors doing the same, the same thing, um, because I think that will then help us to drive even more collaborative action together. Um, and in terms of next steps, our real focus here is on responsible recruitment um, and ensuring no worker pays a fee for a job. Um, so it's again about really moving the dial on, helping people to get to below the surface, understand where the risks are, and really form um, effective plans to mitigate the risks. So um, I'm really delighted that we're having this um, webinar with investors uh, on the line. Um, it's absolutely vital that you're asking the questions of businesses um, because we know that makes a real difference. Um, it, it does exist, I believe, in every single company, and it is a material um, risk. Uh, what is really important is that we start a conversation using that statement to, and make it such that businesses feel it's not about being frightened to start. It's about starting and making some progress. It is such a big um, issue to deal with. For many, I think there's still that fear of, of acknowledging the problem for fear that, um, that they'll expose themselves um, for what they don't know. Um, my, my view is every slave prevented has the same effect on life as rescuing a slave. So um, let's focus on, on actively protecting. Excellent. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, for the participants, if you would like to put any forward any questions, uh, there will be the opportunity to do so after each of the three speakers. I'll move then on, please, to Matt. Hi, everyone. i just double-check everyone can hear me. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Nahida. Uh, thank you, Louise, for your opening comments. Um, it's great to get a chance to speak with you today. Uh, about the investor angle and all of this um, and our engagement particularly on modern slavery and human rights risks in the supply chain over the years. For those of you that don't know us, we are the specialist SRI arm of Rathbones and we act mainly in the private client and charity space here in the UK. Uh, been PRI signatories since about 2009 and been actively engaging on this issue for about the last decade or so. Uh, so jumping straight in, um, this first slide should give you a bit of a context about who we are and, and how we work. So our ESG analysis is built into the investment process. Uh, the key point of difference here is that we have our own in-house database on ESG ratings and ethical screening. So that's a, a real help when it comes to um, getting an in-depth understanding of the issues. And it has a number of outputs, which you see at the bottom of there. Uh, one of which is that it really helps us um, set engagement priorities. Uh, so we look at companies individually, but we also look at them in their peer group context. And this uh, really helps um, identify uh, good targets for engagement, as we'll come on to later. But just a word here about why investor engagement is an important tool, particularly in this issue. Um, I think it's very clear that from our analysis that you know this is a thematic problem. It's a cross-society, cross-economy problem. Um, it's been, you know, modern slavery, let's be clear, slavery itself has been illegal for centuries, yet it still persists in various forms. However much we resource law enforcement, we'll always be kind of one step behind organized crime. So as we see it, we need a, a cross-economy effort to reduce the incentives for this illicit trade. Bonded labor, forced labor, human trafficking, they all have an opportunity cost which hits valuations to our portfolios in the long run. So as an issue, there's a very obvious kind of moral case for action, uh, but there's also a pretty strong financial case uh, that aligns pretty well with it. So just moving out of it and thinking more generally about how we engage and then specifically about how we engage on modern slavery, just wanted to show you here our approach to engagement. I think it is worthwhile to sit down and have a think about your strategy and how you want to go about things as it helps you identify the things you'll get involved in and the things you'll kind of say polite no to. So we're a relatively small player. We don't have um, huge amounts of assets under management. 
uh, mainly due to our robust ethical screens. We don't have huge exposure to the worst offenders uh, in this area. So our strategy has been to adopt a narrow but very deep set of engagements where we feel we can make a big difference. So it spans thematic issues and company issues, but it generally understand, starts with an understanding of the risk. We'll map it against the, our exposure and select a target. Um, and generally, we'll look to flow through this pyramid, sort of moving from informal dialogue through to AGM work, all the way to the top there, I think the important step uh, of potential divestment from a company, a well-communicated divestment being the ultimate sanction that we can give. And then a bit more in detail about our methodology, hopefully this is helpful to you as PRI members about how we've developed our response. So. We'll generally be looking at sort of three aspects when we're considering uh, engagement in an area. Um, once our in-house screening has highlighted these thematic issues that we want to engage on, we'll cross-check with our external providers to look at targets and then look at our exposure. There's two elements here for us to consider. Clearly, if it's uh, widely held against our ethical portfolios, then we'd have an incentive to engage. But it might also be that we've got a large, significant charity which might have you know, one holding for us, but it would be significant for them. So we'll take it forward from that point of view. Uh, secondly, size, and then we're thinking here really about the target company itself. Not that we wouldn't engage with smaller companies, but we're looking here to have the most influence. We're looking here to have the most positive impact we can uh, on the issue. So we'll be looking uh, who has the power, who has the bargaining power, who has the authority. So an issue might, say, get uncovered with a smaller kind of player down the supply chain which we're exposed to, but actually the engagement will be more worthwhile further up the supply chain. So we're trying to be pragmatic in that sense as well. We also need to uh, consider the company in context and think about whether it might be better to engage with a whole peer group, a whole subset of a, a part of the economy rather than a single company. And finally, we're looking at what the potential for influence is and whether um, the actual engagement issue that we're talking about is best dealt with through an individual engagement or perhaps it might be better to engage with policymakers. And just finally there, you know, having an awareness of whether the company or companies are really open to dialogue, having an idea that we want our engagements to be long-term and effective and we want to know what we're getting into and how much effort we're going to have to put in up front. So knowing where a sector is in terms of its openness is key before you start. So that's the theory. Just moving on to a few more uh, actual examples about how we've worked on this particular issue. So having through that, gone through that process, we've arrived at a general position that uh, we ask for transparency in supply chains as a means to try and create the incentives for companies to go looking for modern slavery. And it accords very strongly, I think, with the approach that M&S have taken. Um, we're trying to create these incentives, as I say, for people to go out and proactively try and uncover and fix incidences of uh, supply chain, uh, labour right abuses in the supply chain. And that's made easier by transparency driven by the regulations that we've mentioned. So where we started on this a few years ago um, was to uh, co-sponsor a report with a couple of other partners, Finance Against Trafficking, US and ECCR, looking at the uh, disclosures on uh, forced labour and human trafficking in FTSE 100, which helped set the scene and explain how we felt companies should be responding to these issues. And we've also seen the development of lots of helpful resources like the TISC report website, which enables you um, to compare and contrast company responses. All of these things help you uh, build a target list and start build uh, sets of uh, questions which you might want to ask um, to a whole subset of companies. On the next slide, this is much more recently what we've been up to in the past sort of year, 12 months. Um, we uh, worked quite closely with the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre here in the UK um, in terms of engaging um, with the outputs of their report into um, the first uh, iteration of the reporting cycle under the Modern Slavery Act, particularly looking again at the FTSE 100 and seeing which of the FTSE 100 companies had actually met the Modern Slavery Act reporting requirements. And this was quite a straightforward engagement, but quite powerful what we did. Uh, we got the detailed list from the BHRRC, 
uh, identified the kind of laggards we felt on that approach, identified 34 companies where there was an obvious gap in their reporting, wrote to the chief executive, wrote to the chairman, had follow-up meetings, and that's definitely produced at least one improved ranking um, through the dialogue there with a particular company. So I would highlight as well the work that the core coalition have done uh, with producing this guide along with Anti-Slavery International and the BHRRC. It uh, gives you a really clear way of kind of engaging with companies um, who are involved in these issues. And I would say it's well worth getting hold of these guides, even if you're not primarily exposed to the UK. Uh, I don't think the issue um, is so complex that it can't be understood outside of the UK context. And I think these guides are excellent uh, and would be a fantastic jump off for anybody looking to make a start on engaging on these issues. So that was kind of, um, I guess, company engagement. I think it's worth mentioning just as our close um, policy targets and policy engagement. Um, it often feels, I think, as investors that um, it's a slightly trickier area for us to get involved in. But from my experience here, um, policymakers always love to hear from investors, and we actually have a huge amount of influence in this area. If a business can be seen as in favour of a particular move, it, it goes a long way to countering arguments about increased red tape and too much regulation. Um, so recently we have engaged with the Public Accounts Committee inquiry into reducing modern slavery. Uh, our submission was really welcome there, and I'm sure it would be from, from other investors around the world. Uh, and we've also seen um, recent examples of um, other countries seeking to roll out Modern Slavery Act, transparency and supply chains like legislation, uh, and we submitted a response to the relevant um, regulator in Canada, for example. And I just wanted to sort of highlight that as a, as a means not to be forgotten. Certainly we need to engage with companies, but uh, we can make a huge difference if we see uh, things like the Modern Slavery Act uh, reproduced across uh, the world. And the finally, for me, I just wanted to highlight um, a few questions that you might want to ask, um, some of the things you might want to um, dig into with companies that you've identified. Um, not all of them will be as advanced as, as um, M&S, sadly. Um, but we want to, you know, you can use the framework from the Transparency and Supply Chains Clause in the Modern Slavery Act. You can ask them what steps they're taking to ensure compliance with various Transparency and Supply Chains Clauses. Asking them what actions they've taken to really evaluate the risk. Quite often, uh, companies haven't even got that far. But as we've said, and Louise has mentioned, we do feel this is a, an economy-wide economy risk which potentially affects every company. So it's a legitimate question to ask all of your holdings, I feel. I can ask them what policies they've put in place to identify and eliminate the risks of modern slavery and forced labour. Uh, a key one to ask is what steps they've taken to train employees and supply chain employees particularly um, to identify and eliminate slavery at that level of the supply chain. Um, so that's just a few ideas about where you can get started and the kind of questions you can ask. Very happy to go into a bit more detail on that on the uh, Q&A section later. Uh, but that's probably enough for me from now, so I'll, I'll hand back to Nahida. I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions um, as they come up. Great, Matt. Thank you very much for that. And we're going to move now to our third speaker, Emily. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be speaking to an investor audience today. So, as Nahida said, I am the labour market and private sector lead for Kevin Hyland, who is the UK's first independent anti-slavery commissioner. So, my role is to support the commissioner tackling forced labour in the largest companies, multinationals, right down to the high street where there are issues too. And it's our office's view that investors are absolutely vital in this, uh, in this fight to eradicate modern slavery for many of the reasons that Louise and Matt have already outlined. So, oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so the, the role of the commissioner, for those who aren't aware, was established under the Modern Slavery Act. And you can see there what the legislation says. Uh, he is intended to encourage good practice in the prevention, detection, investigation, and prosecution of slavery and human trafficking, and the identification of victims. And sometimes uh, when I'm talking to businesses, it can seem like not all of that is relevant, but our view is actually that all of those uh, aspects are relevant to the private sector, from preventing modern slavery, so as Louise said, recruitment fees, 
detecting? Is there a whistleblowing policy? Are there audits which are being done in the right way? Uh, investigation and prosecution means really strong partnerships with enforcement agencies, things like that. Uh, Kevin uh, legally uh, has uh, several uh, public bodies have a duty to cooperate with him. That's all law enforcement and border security, all local government, the NHS and the Gang Masters and Labour Abuse Authority. So our office has a very wide view uh, crossing over every aspect. So in terms of our work with the private sector, it is one of our priority areas. You can see that on the left hand side in the blue box. And people have already referred, of course, to Section 54. This is the well-known transparency in supply chains clause, requiring all companies with a turnover of 36 million and over to provide a disclosure annually, uh, explaining how they're dealing with this or if they are at all. And uh, of course, this only pertains to the largest companies, but we have to remember that part of the purpose of this mechanism is to create a kind of cascade downwards of action through the supply chains so we can get into the smallest tiers of business in the UK and abroad by having this policy in place. And we will uh, come back to the efficacy of Section 54 in a moment. But first, uh, a few kind of facts. So as it's already been said, it's estimated there are 40 million people in slavery today. But it's important to point out that that same uh, estimation from the ILO and Walk Free Foundation says that 16 million are estimated to be working in the private sector. So this is really not something investors or business can turn away from. It's absolutely essential that they're part of the fight. On the left, you can see a table from the ILO, which shows sectoral distribution of victims. And whilst you can see domestic work is very significantly represented there, you can see that construction, manufacturing, agriculture, fishing, right through essentially everything that a, a large supply chain might be touching on, is represented there in some way. So there are pretty much no businesses that can afford not to look at this, even businesses that sometimes think it's not relevant. So for example, you might look at a bank. Uh, obviously, they're going to be less exposed in some ways than a retailer. However, they still have a supply chain of some form. They will still have probably some temporary labor in various parts of their business and supply chain. Um, and actually, specifically for banking, uh, the money that people make from forced labor is going somewhere. Um, so there's a whole money laundering um, kind of risk flagging area around that as well. Uh, you can see three headlines I've pulled from the BBC's website on the right. Um, and uh, this isn't a kind of scare tactic, but it's important to look at what these tell us. So the, the next John Lewis and Donnell Mill failed to spot slaves at a bed factory in West Yorkshire. This is really important because uh, those companies had actually audited that bed factory not so long before they were found to be using what was referred to as a slave workforce, 42 men in a two-bedroomed house being paid nothing or as little as £10 a day uh, under intimidation, surviving off food scraps, etc. And what this tells us is that auditing has to change if it's going to capture these issues. Tick box social audits that don't really take an investigatory approach aren't going to be good enough. Um, it's a different topic, but we should always remember that the Rana Plaza factory that collapsed, which I'm sure we all remember, uh, had also been audited not that long before that happened. Uh, and the auditors said they didn't capture the potential issues because building safety wasn't on their checklist, essentially. So we really need to look at auditing as we talk about this. Um, of course, that bed factory also says something else, which is a material issue, is that those beds certainly didn't arrive at those shops. So there's a disruption on a, on a material scale here as well, potentially. The second two headlines show that there is a, a, a monetary uh, danger with having modern slavery it, within businesses. There are huge compensation settlements possible. And of course, it's also um, criminal, uh, life imprisonment, potential sentence. So this is really uh, something that we can't afford to look away from. And of course, as everyone's aware, any kind of uh, headline like this is a big reputational risk as well. So on uh, compliance and enforcement, uh, again referring to um, the research that Matt talked about from the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, who've done great work analysing the FTSE 100's 
disclosures, they found that 43 of the FTSE 100 were non-compliant with Section 54 in 2017. And by non-compliant, I mean that they did not meet the three requirements. So it has to be uh, linked to from the home page, approved by the board, and signed by a director. They're not such complex things. They're not even about the substantive content of the disclosures, and yet they were still non-compliant. Uh, my own uh, analysis uh, in the, with the BHRC as well has found that 23 of the FTSE 250 did not even produce a statement last year. So this is actually against the law. Uh, often statements are low quality, not all, as we've heard about uh, MSs, which is consistently ranked highest or one of the highest. But you can see a couple of examples here that might be useful to investors. The first example is from a um, a precious metals producer that operates in South America. And you can see that that's essentially just letting us know what forced labor looks like. It's not in any way relevant specifically to their business where they operate the sector that they're in. It's a kind of a cut and paste job. And this is quite common. And I'd suggest that if investors are looking at statements that say this, it might suggest that that company hasn't looked into this properly. The second example you can see is actually from a letter to us because we wrote to the non-compliant FTSE 100. And this is a company that runs private medical care in a few jurisdictions in the world, one of which is very, very well known for having a lot of tied labor issues. And this company has said to us that their, their um, statement doesn't really give any detail because there is limited or no risk that they could in any way, whether directly or indirectly, be involved in slavery, slavery or human trafficking activities. And this comes back to what Louise was saying that we completely agree with and feel very strongly about. This is not trying not to find the issue. The issue is highly likely to be there. And the best and bravest companies are going to find it, root it out, remediate it, and admit to it to share practice and improve over time. So this is, these are the kinds of responses that we want to change from companies over time. But there are, there are good examples. Uh, lots of this has been touched on already, um, but these are kind of some of the key things you might look for from a good statement. And I would say that um, I would recommend if, if people are not familiar with what a good statement might look like, reading m and or there's a FTSE 250 called Marshalls that is also strong on this, and looking at the component parts that really look like substantive action is a good way of setting a benchmark for what to look for from other companies. These include things like supply chain mapping, risk analyses, a focus on root causes. So the employer pays principle is what Louise mentioned, uh, another way of saying what Louise mentioned earlier is phasing out recruitment fees. These are a key factor in enabling debt bondage and a massive, massive problem for the migrant workforce. Again, trade unionism um, is a, a really important aspect to A, spotting, uh, spotting people that may be in trouble, but B, enabling workers to come together and have a collective voice, and it's widely recognized as an important tool to fight against this. Training staff, and that means across the entire organization. So obviously HR is relevant here, but also procurement. Uh, any staff that are putting in orders for things, are those orders uh, being made on such unrealistically short timeframes that new labor is going to have to be brought in that cannot possibly have had checks properly done to ensure that there is no forced labor there? High level ownership in a company, absolutely vital, though of course that needs to go all the way down to the officers in HR, et cetera, who are doing everything. Uh, working with expert on the ground NGOs, especially if that company has operations in far flung areas where it can't possibly know exactly what's going on in the ground. Sector specific initiatives are really important and I always look, are companies involved with these? So that's things like, um, the UK Stop Slavery Hotels Network that's doing good work in, uh, for hotels. Uh, the Chartered Institute of Building and Stronger Together have done lots on construction. The Consumer Goods Forum has uh, made Mon Slavery one of its priority areas to work on. This kind of thing, which is about sharing knowledge and taking real specific action rather than just talking about it. And we always want to see year-on-year -year progress, and that's going to get more and more meaningful uh, the more years we have disclosures. Did a company say, okay, we've mapped supply, uh, tier one of our supply chain this year, and we're going to map tier two next year? We, I really want to see that kind of clarity, and then checking back, have they actually done these things? Um, on uh, compliance and enforcement of Section 54, this is a question that comes up quite a lot uh, from lots of stakeholders. 
So the law actually uh, allows for the possibility of injunctions to be taken out against companies by Secretary of State if they do not comply with Section 54. This has not happened yet. The government's been very clear that it wants to encourage better practice at the moment. It's the early stage of the legislation. But of course, it's not always going to be the early stage of the legislation. So we have to wonder where we have a significant proportion of the largest companies in the UK not yet compliant. How long is this going to carry on being the same situation? Maybe we will see injunctions in the future. Um, and there are other levers um, that our office are certainly interested in and many others to encourage compliance. So investors are obviously absolutely key to this. Public procurement, there are more and more calls for government to embed uh, Section 54 style thinking into their own procurement. Councils in England and Wales alone spend £40 billion a year on buying in goods and services. So this would be a powerful game changer. And we are seeing both central government and local authorities start looking at this more. So if, if you um, in, are invested in a business that has that kind of contract, this is going to be very relevant. Favouring suppliers that can show they're taking substantive action is something we support. And then what I would call outsider pressure, so rankings, some of which are really relevant to uh, yourselves as investors, like the Corporate Human Rights Benchmark, uh, Share Actions Workforce Disclosure Initiative, things like that. Press, of course, we saw some stories earlier, and anyone who's been reading the British media in the last few months will know that uh, modern slavery is a topic that they like to write about and consumers where it's relevant to the businesses. Uh, this is definitely true for the high street. Uh, it can't have escaped people's attention that consumers are becoming more aware of the problems in nail bars and hand car washes, but it will likely track up to bigger businesses too in time. So finally, just coming on to what we see as the role for investors in all this. <clears throat> Firstly, obviously this is an ethical issue that investors frankly should care about and um, when we talk about labour and the workforce, these are very kind of amorphous, anonymous sounding terms and we need to remember we're not talking about that, we're talking about individuals who are just like me and you, who have families and ambitions and dreams and food they like and music they like and all of these things that people don't necessarily say on investor webinars, they are real people and you have the potential to get them out of a very bad real situation. Secondly, this is uh, from a commercial perspective about ensuring a level playing field. So an example, if you have a fashion company that has stopped sourcing from suppliers in Leicester because they are known to have an intractable forced labour issue, but another fashion company doesn't care about that, so they're still sourcing from them and they're able to undercut the company that has behaved more ethically, this is obviously anti-competitive, it creates a big problem from an economic perspective. So we want a race to the top um, and, and that's a very important aspect. We've got increasing international action, um, Matt has already mentioned this, but we've got legislation obviously in the UK, also in California, in the Netherlands and in France around this kind of topic, Australia is coming in at the Commissioner's Office, we're talking to a number of countries and the Commonwealth around legislation and this isn't going to go away. So intelligent companies are going to get on the front foot with this because it's going to start hitting them on a legislative basis from a number of different jurisdictions. There's also the risk of litigation or disruption to production, which we've talked about already, but you know, that's a, that's a material risk. And there's a reputational risk here, and that might be B2B or B2C, depending on the nature of the company. Um, but it's, it's certainly not something that can be ignored and as uh, kind of awareness of this topic grows and increases over time, it's going to become more and more important. So we would like to see investors understanding what good Section 54 disclosures look like and what meaningful action companies should be taking. And uh, Matt's already said some great questions that investors can be asking and he's referenced briefings and we completely agree with that. You know, what risk analysis has that company done? How is the issue held within the company? What's their root cause analysis? Why are the problems happening where they're, propening, ha where they're happening? Uh, what breaches have been found? You know, are they admitting that breaches have been found? Uh, there's no shame in that. How are they being remediated? What's the action plan? So they're, they're quite clear questions that any company that's really doing its work on this should have answers to. 
And I suppose I'd also say that no company has solved this. You can't solve it. It's an ongoing problem. And no company should have done everything already, but they should be able to show progress over time, like I said earlier, mapping, phasing it in, getting new policies in place bit by bit by bit, as you would with any large project, frankly. So finally, uh, to investors, I'd say, do you know your businesses? Do you know which ones are at greatest risk on this issue? You have to target your engagement, as Matt said. So how are you identifying the ones where you're going to target your resources on this issue towards? Do you know which ones aren't compliant with the law? Do you know who those 43 of the FTSE 100 are that are in a report as non-compliant? And uh, for businesses, asking them, do they know their own business? If they don't know their supply chain, is that not a little concerning on a number of levels, not just a modern slavery perspective? Where are they at risk and how are they addressing it? And so finally, I would reiterate what the other two speakers have said. For us, this is not about saying we have not found it. It's not about showing that your supply chain is clean, because it's highly unlikely, even if it is now clean, to be permanently clean in the uh, global economic situation that we have. This is about being brave. It's about cleaning on an ongoing basis, admitting what you found, addressing it, and bringing up the rest of the business sector with you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you to each of our speakers. That's been, I think, very helpful tools and advice that has been given there in terms of how investors can effectively engage on this issue. Um, we're going to now turn to the Q&A. Um, so if you look on the bottom right-hand side corner, um, there is an opportunity for you to outline your questions. Now, some of those questions come through, and maybe put a question uh, in reverse order to Emily. Um, you mentioned a bit about the injunctions, but I suppose with companies that have been unresponsive to investor engagement, to either disclose or strengthen the modern slavery approach, can such matters be escalated by investors to the Office of the Anti-Slavery Commissioner? And if so, what kind of role uh, can they expect the office to play? Well, firstly, I'd say that um, there are obviously some investment houses doing really impressive work on this. Rathbones being one of them and several others, but I don't believe that the investor uh, sector as a whole has yet necessarily taken this on and really started asking companies in-depth questions about this, having it as an engagement priority. So I think there's a lot more work to be done there, and uh, my, my pri prior role at Share Action working with investors uh, you know, you do, you do see companies reacting if investors take something really seriously. So I suppose that's a real call to action for investors. Um, but of course, um, I would always be interested to hear about companies that are being unresponsive and uh, what's, what's happening in the engagement there and would try to support an investor to work out, well, what, what can be done? You know, is it sometimes companies genuinely don't think it's relevant to them, so you need to explain where it might be in their business or they, uh, they kind of don't know what to do about it. It sounds like this massive topic. We've outlined a lot of work, which would take a lot of time and resources. So you can take an approach that's more hand-holding and educational, um, or sometimes companies really need to understand that there is law around this and it needs to be taken really seriously. But I'm always very happy to hear from investors who'd like to get in touch. Thank you. And then a question, please, for Louise. Um, this is from one of the participants. Where Marks & Spencers has been working with companies down the supply chain, e.g. Tier 2 below, to what extent has it been possible to drive change where issues were identified, and what steps have been the most successful in driving that change? So um, I, think that, I think the biggest change that's been able to be achieved is, is where you can take the first tier suppliers with you on the journey too. So if we look at the produce supply chains in the UK, um, where a number of the um, issue, issues that have come to light over the last few years or, or the, um, the, the successes with prosecutions with traffickers are often in the second tier of the produce supply chain. But by working together with the produce suppliers, on Stronger Together, which is an awareness raising training, um, that's been hugely successful um, and ripples out to the, the next tier down of the supply chain. And what's come to light is it has been staff working alongside exploited staff who've realized what's going on and, and raised the issue with management. And that has been really effective. So, um, it, but it is about taking them on the journey. Similar into, in Thailand, 
Um, what's, what's been really important is not to dive down into the lower tiers of the supply chain without taking the first tier of the supply chain with you, because, um, or the, well, the first and the second tier of the supply chain, because if you don't take them with you, they can be disruptive and blockers of you actually getting to hear about the issue because they're not being included and they're concerned about what it might mean for their business. So, you know, it's about, it's about taking them with, with you. It's about recognizing you need um, a very local collaborative initiative, which has got the right NGOs and trade unions and government involved, so that you're really uncovering the real examples of the issues as they're happening and then working together on what is the right suitable collaborative action in that locality. Because it, you know, we are talking about a criminal element here that is exploiting people. The criminal element is very fast to change its methods of exploitation. So it doesn't work to be a long way removed from where that's happening um, because you need to be right on top of it, um, understanding and responding to it. On, on the comment, I see there's another comment there about audit. I think we need to be really, really careful here. Um, when people talk about auditing their supply chain, in most cases they're talking about an ethical audit of that particular factory. Now, the nature of the ethical audit of the factory is that they interview the people that are there on the day, a small sample of them, and they review the records that are there on the day. In many cases, what we're talking about with modern slavery, it, it, it is about the third-party labor contractor who has supplied some of that temporary labor. So at the ethical audit of that site, they will not be able to look at the paperwork that refers to those uh, temporary workers that have been delivered for the day. They might be lucky enough that when they interview some people, they might interview a proportion of um, temporary workers, but it's not really going to get to the issues of modern slavery. That's more, much more likely if the um, audit is happening of the third party labor provider, which is what happens in a gang master um, licensing abuse um, uh, in, inspection. But again, the important bit here is we've already tried a voluntary code of this that was called the Temporary Labour Working Group, which was before we formed uh, the GLAA. And the reason why that wasn't very successful is if you don't have access to the tax evasion um, uh, and, um, and all those um, um, uh, additional uh, tools that obviously um, uh, government enforcement bodies have in terms of being able to really check that the ID is not for fraudulent. If you don't have access to that, the audit can only be one limited tool in the toolbox. And I think that's, it's about recognizing the lim limitations of audits. They can play a role, but you cannot absolutely say, this means there's no evidence of slavery because I've got a clean audit. It's about what other um, forms of intelligence you have that, that go around that audit to further strengthen it, which is why it's so important people have effective whistleblowing um, policies and that those that are effectively being used and people trust them. And it is also so much about um, how you talk to people um, in terms of the service level agreements that are in place between labor providers, um, that they've got the right policies, um, that you're doing uh, coffee shop mornings with some of those temporary workers. You're, you're opening the door to hear anything and everything that there might be going on. Uh, and that's the, the best eyes and ears chance you've got, along with doing awareness tra training that you'll find those issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Louise. Um, we've had some uh, very supporting and encouraging comments coming through from the participants saying that they've, um, you know, welcomed the insights um, on the webinar. So, you know, please do keep the questions coming and I'll run through them shortly. Just one question for myself to Matt. Um, with voting being one of the cornerstones of stewardship activity, is it firstly appropriate? And secondly, is there any mechanism to integrate an investor's views and in particular concerns on modern slavery into their portfolio voting decisions? Thanks, Nahid. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one um, when it comes to um, particularly the UK. In the development of the Act, um, there was a quite a considerable amount of debate about whether the uh, Modern Slavery Act um, transparency kind of statement should form part of the annual strategic report or not. Uh, and in the end, it was decided that, that it would be a sort of outside of the annual report. So I guess technically, um, it, it can't immediately be dropped into a kind of voting template because we're not, you know, you think about the resolutions you might be able to vote against um, on reporting, uh, it doesn't immediately kind of reach across. 
What we are looking at, however, is um, asking the question of the companies that haven't produced a report. Um, one of the issues, that, one of the requirements, as Emily uh, outlined, was that the report has to be signed off by a board director. So um, if we have an example of a company that A, doesn't have the report or doesn't have a report signed off by a director, we will be talking to the chairman in advance of doing some work at AGMs uh, this year and perhaps next year. So that's one area where we might be able to yeah, provide a bit of leverage for some of these laggards in the FTSE 350, I think, um, talking to the chairman or relevant um, nominated board directors who have responsibility in this area, asking why they haven't produced a report signed by one of them uh, as required by law. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then a, a question, please, from Matt and Emily. Do you have any concrete recommendations as to how an asset manager should go about analysing an existing portfolio to identify one that they have the highest risk to be associated with modern slavery? And secondly, for whom modern slavery risks are most likely to be financially material? And are there any resources that you can recommend? And I, I think you obviously you touched a bit upon that in the presentations. Should we come to, to you, Emily, first? Sure. Um, though I think as an asset manager, I'm sure Matt will have uh, very, very useful things to say on this. Um, uh, there's kind of general ways that you can tell wh where the highest risk is going to be. So the type of labor, is it lower skilled? Is it high, likely to be a high proportion of migrant labor? Is it likely to be <clears throat> temporary or seasonal labor? Um, so these would be indicators. Is it within a country or jurisdiction where there are weaker labor laws and regulations or where there's uh, a known um, issue around tied labor, which might be legal there, but might also be considered an issue within forced labor? So there's kind of quite obvious indicators that can be used to, to analyze that. Um, but I'll pass over to Matt as an actual asset manager. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, without giving away too much of pri proprietary analysis about how we go about these things, um, I think there's a huge amount of um, data out there which an asset manager can use to build into its models. Um, there's various kind of global overarching um, bits of research which you can use to sort of help refine your engagement lists. Uh, I particularly use the Global Slavery Index and identify um, the uh, priority countries. So there's kind of yeah, there's a huge amount of people, 40 million affected by this, but there is a, a large concentration on kind of five, six countries. So I um, have a, an ongoing kind of list uh, of companies with exposure to these kind of five areas that whenever we meet with management, we ask about, particularly about their labor management. Uh, if, if you use um, the likes of MSCI or any of these kind of other data uh, and ratings agencies, you know, really put them to task and ask them to provide the data, ask them to provide uh, what they feel are the most, um, yeah, I guess the, um, they are the, think are the most kind of high priority areas. Uh, I would also use, um, I like to use the kind of Transparency, um, Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index as a, as a guideline for kind of country risk as well. So yeah, those are the kind of tools we use as, a, as an overarching view of kind of country risk. Particularly on the kind of how do I identify which areas are most financially um, at risk from lack of compliance. I think it is those that have um, a domicile in a country with, you know, very, very clear modern slavery or forced labour and human trafficking um, legislation, because I do think the kind of reputational elements are the ones which crystallise fastest. Um, and just finally, you know, don't, I guess I, uh, my, my key point on this, and it's something that Louisa said and Emily has said, that yeah, it's all about identifying targets, sure, but actually with this particular issue, it can crop up at any point at anyone's supply chain. So it's worth asking the question of every company you, you come across. And the example I always use on this one would be um, Western Union money transfer. And we were talking to them about um, whether they had any exposure to supply chain risk and particularly to modern slavery. Uh, and they told us they'd done the audit, they'd worked out that, you know, well, you know, we're just a finance transfer company. What possible exposure do we have to kind of these labour markets, et cetera? But we encourage them to kind of look a bit deeper, look a bit closer. Uh, they mapped their exposure against the um, incidences of modern slavery and the um, Global Slavery Index and looked at their um, activities in terms of money transfer in Thailand. They then worked with a local law enforcement agency to think about, you know, where are the hotspots for 
kind of um, organized crime, which might be linked to money, uh, human trafficking. Um, and they came across uh, patterns of transfers um, from businesses linked to the nail bar industry there in Thailand at 2, 3 in the morning, huge amounts of money going across. And it turns out there was, um, you know, an indirect but nonetheless a link there to the organised crime, to the crime rings, which were um, using their money transfer networks to send around proceeds of human trafficking. So we've gone from a situation where a company had said, oh, we, you know, we don't think we've got any exposure here, to thinking, oh gosh, we actually have, and we can, but crucially, we can have an influence in kind of stopping this flow of finance. So, yeah, I think, you know, yes, indeed, be kind of smart, be clever about where you choose your engagement targets. But particularly on this one, um, I do think it is a cross-sector or cross-economy issue. And I think every company we come across should be asked the questions. Uh, and I think that it has benefits as well. Thinking about this particular human rights issue and dealing with it will help deal with uh, any number of kind of human rights risks and issues in the supply chain more generally. Great, thank you. We probably have time for one more question. Uh, perhaps we can put this forward to Louise. Um, Louise, the companies that um, may have concerns, um, how, how would you allay some of those concerns where they say that they're not able to demonstrate that their supply chain is entirely free of modern slavery, which then hinders them putting out any disclosures and having discussions with investors? Well, the starting point I always uh, share is the fact that um, as M&S chose to be more transparent, A, to share that we did find modern slavery issues, but also um, our supply chain map, um, we haven't found that led to a deluge of, um, of people rushing forward with more issues. Um, in, in fact, quite the opposite, a general um, growing of trust with some of those more um, competitive um, stakeholders. So, you know, that, that's one way I would, would say to people, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it, it do not fear. I think the other point is, um, you know, the Rana Plaza example, which, you know, m and wasn't involved in that terrible tragedy. But the big thing about it, it was it was in YouTube and seven minutes later, it game changed um, the way businesses could operate. You know, up until then, you could maybe spend 24, 48 hours putting together whether or not you were in a site and um, what, you know, what on earth you've been doing in that site and, and to, to look like you had effective due diligence. Not anymore. The, the phone call comes often... Um, or, 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 the, uh, or the social media tweet comes with expecting a response within hours. And, um, you know, so I think businesses have to be on top of this. They have to be prepared for a much more um, transparent world. Um, you know, the reality is I was in India, uh, even in the remotest parts of India um, last month, and uh, everybody had a mobile phone. Um, so, again, if, with the access of a mobile phone, anyone anywhere can start a campaign. So, again, um, businesses need to be on the front foot of this, not waiting uh, to be exposed. Um, what Thank I have you. said to suppliers, where, they, where they're frightened about how to get started, is, is I think the most important bit is to determine where you think you might have a risk and start investigating. And BT stood up at our Indian conference, and they were talking about their Indian office and where they'd started. And they'd started by looking at cleaners and taxi firms because that was the initial part. And then they were able to demonstrate that, that they did the piece of work and then realized that they didn't have a risk there. But the confidence that they gained by picking off an area where they realized they didn't know anything about it and finding out that the controls were good enough gave them confidence to then feel they could go and look somewhere else. And I think this is so often the starting point is people just are almost frightened to get started. And what's more important is get started, even if it's in a little way, and gain the confidence from it and then move on to the next bit. One of the things that we've been involved in helping to have uh, found is something called SNET. And that is really about helping to bring uh, food uh, suppliers and brands and retailers together to risk assess the supply chain. And, and a big part of that is just giving people the confidence to sit in a room and say, I'm a bit stuck here. Um, have I asked the right questions? Have I got back the right depth of answer? But doing it in a collaborative way where we can all be learning together and then going out and doing some uh, shared, shared look to understand how effective the due diligence is. Um, and that's, again, just about building confidence because this is so beyond one company to solve the issue. We need uh, other companies to up their game uh, and get involved too. 
Thank you, Louise. And unfortunately, um, we've run out of time, but thank you so much to each of our speakers for opening up about their approach and sharing so honestly your experiences, and which I'm sure that our participants have found very valuable and, and helpful. Um, and thank you also for the participants for joining the webinar today and contributing to the discussions. Um, if you do have any follow-up um, uh, questions, please do get in touch with myself at nahida.chowdhury at the umpri.org. Um, and also, if you would like to participate in any of our investor briefings on this topic, please also do get in touch by before the 6th of March. Thank you very much.